Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Here are your hosts, Richard Saunders and Stefan Soika. Hello, Richard. Hello, Stefan. Stefan, it's a bit crowded in the old Skeptic Zone studios today. It certainly is. And I've got my back to you and everything because we're, <laughs> we're using separate microphones and we're all packed in here. We're packed. We have a special guest for the introduction, Maynard. Well, you're, oh, sorry, I'm wearing my, my big pants. It re- reduces the room available in the area. <laughs> I thought they went out of fashion, but there you go. With MC Hammer. They're, they're quantum <laughs> pants and they're a bit like the TARDIS. That's all I can say. <laughs> Now, uh, uh, we joined by Maynard today because we're recording, and it's Australia Day, so a big salute to Australia, everybody, the 26th of January. This is episode number 223, by the way, but we're all here. We've got some other friends in the back of the room. Hello, friends. Hello. There we go. We're here to record our secret project. We've got Banana Rama in the room with us. Oh. <laughs> On your T-shirt. I know. I'm, I'm wearing a T-shirt. That just sounded like Banana Rama again. Let's try it again. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. Yep, banana rama. <laughs> Amazing, the people who appear on the Skeptic Zone. Yes, we're here to record our secret project, but uh, before we do all that, of course, we're going to talk, tell everybody what's on the show today. Yeah, Richard, um, what is on the show <laughs> today? Because <laughs> I'm so engrossed in this uh, little project, I don't mm. even know what's going on anymore. We've got an interview with a very dear friend of mine, Pamela Gay, the astronomer. Pamela Gay, who's going to tell us about stars and planets and her recent adventures in the universe. Wasn't that an orchestral maneuvers in the dark song? I think it was a B side. Pamela Gay. Pamela Gay, not an orchestral. Oh, Pamela. Sorry, sorry, my mistake. Look, speaking of strange things, we're in Stefan's studio about to listen to Pamela Gay, and he's got a whole bunch of cassettes over there, and it's the greatest collection of Haircut 100 and Spandau Ballet I've ever seen in cassette form. And Tears for Fears. I've got some of those. I have never seen so many cassettes racked up. <laughs> Stefan, that is impressive. Anyway, after uh, my chat with Pamela Gay, it's Dr. Rachie reports talking about false balance. Oh, false balance. False hey, balance. I know all about that. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> You've heard my reports. No, I have heard your reports. Very false balance there. Very interesting, of course, to do with the anti-vaccination lobby crowd gang group. Well, look, there's many times I've been involved in something and the the vaccination issues come up and uh, there's been talk or or there's been talk or there's been or any issue really where they they try and achieve a balance and they're not really thinking about whether they're actually achieving a balance or they're just getting extra people to talk on the same topic from ideas that really don't have any merit. I couldn't have put it any better myself, Maynard. It's happened a few times. In fact, there's actually an editorial passage in the uh, ABC Code of Practice involving uh, balance and false balance. I suggest you look it up. I don't know what section it's in. I suspect it's somewhere after 3.2 because that relates to accuracy. There you go. <laughs> the inside word from Maynard, folks. And to round off the show, Maynard, of course, you're back in Melbourne talking to Warren Burnett from Embiggen Books. Oh, Warren Burnett, yeah, a great guy. Embiggen Books is great. We find out where the word Embiggen comes from in the first place during this interview. And also, while I was interviewing him, and this will be something to the older Melbourne listeners, a member of Melbourne band, X band, The Bachelors from Prague, walked past and oh, came yeah. in and just started saying hello to me. So we had to cut that bit out of the interview. And then I had a great Great chat to Warren about why he does what he does. I mean, come on, owning a bookshop in the 21st century is is a tough endeavour. It is, but it's a great interview, and in Bigham Books is a fantastic bookshop. In fact, while you were there, James Randi pulled the trick on you. He did, and he yeah. also did this magic thing as well, where he um, he uh, he told me to pick a book from the shelf. We need a boom tish, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> a book from the shelf, and uh, open a, a page that I chose, and read the first word, and he knew what that first sentence was. Incredible! Wow. And uh, it's called the book trick in magic circles. Mm. And the thing is, there's a number of ways you can do it. I suspected you were involved in it, Richard. Because you suspected it, that suspected. at the time, but I can tell you sincerely, I was just there as an innocent bystander taking photographs. I had no idea this but, trick was coming up. But it's a great trick. Great I've got trick. no idea how he did it. He could have done it a couple of different ways. I, have, I haven't even bothered to look up on the net because for me, I just... I, just, I want to be amazed. Look, I think the expression, it's fun to be fooled. <laughs> and I was fun being fooled. It was great. And and I got Bad Farmer there. I bought the book Ooh, Bad Farmer that did. day. A good one. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> uh, that reminds me of that time that you tricked me with the uh, the card trick, Richard, uh, where I was totally full, but I was on Bad Pharma at that stage. Oh, really? Yeah. It was well, a- so he only had two cards and went, pick a card. <laughs> he was wrong the first time, and then he went, that's amazing, you got it the second time. The only way to do magic, folks. Stefan, I think we better get on with it. Yes, we better get on with the show, and because uh, we're really engrossed in this project, so let's just do the show, and then we can get on and, and do this magic little Let's, uh, let's all sit back project. now. Why don't we all sit back now? We'll have some of this lovely stuff. Stefan, cold water you've poured for us in the oh, studio. Yeah. We'll all enjoy the Skeptic Zone and then we'll get on with the project. That's all right for you. I'm actually going to have a drink of Banana Rama, a band <laughs> named after a drink. You've got to love that. What do you think, girls? Yay! <laughs> And joining me on the line from wonderfully cool, cold, crisp, snowy, and did I mention cool, Edwardsville, Illinois, Pamela Gay. Hello, Pamela. Hello, Richard. How are you doing? I'm doing okay, apart from the fact that it's stinking hot in Sydney and high humidity, but uh, the only good thing is um, it makes the beach rather attractive, but apart from that, I think I'd rather swap with you. Uh, you know, we, we have this strange combination of our first flowers are starting to come up, but we're also still getting snow. So it's that interesting time of the year where Mother Nature doesn't know what it should be. And sometimes I wonder, Pamela, if you know what you should be or where you should be. I notice that you do an awful lot of traveling. It's quite scary. I, I do. It's really quite amazing at times. Uh, but what I'm doing is working to travel the world and build a community of, of people who are learning and doing science together. And we meet in the real world and then we take what we're doing online and, and keep the journey of exploration going. That's very exciting. And I know you're a woman who really does use the Internet probably to its fullest extent or, or as much as you possibly can. Can you tell our audience a little bit about your Internet internet activities, including these um, Google Hangouts? Yes. So so just like you, I got my start in some ways with, with podcasting. And as the technology has changed, we've gotten to do more and more amazing things. And most recently, Google and Google Plus launched what's called Google Hangouts on Air. And it's this amazing free technology that allows up to 10 different people to gather via video conferencing software, but it's smart software that will naturally go from one person to another that enables screen sharing and has many other additional features. And then we we can take this video conversation that we're generating and we can share it out to the world via YouTube Live. And, and we're using this to do things like every Sunday evening, we get together a bunch of amateur astronomers with telescopes, and we hold a star party where we invite people to look through telescopes with us and just explore the sky. That's, uh, that's rather exciting stuff. I'm sure that those hangouts must be very popular. It, it's really amazing how many people we get joining us. And we're, we're looking to take this from not just several hundred people gathering around to look through the telescopes, but we also stream out special events. We uh, did live coverage of the Mars Curiosity Lander well, landing. We, we've covered the transit of Venus. And as we move into the future, we're working to work more and more with NASA and other missions to help find ways for people to stay up to date on what's going on in astronomy. Well, it's, it's one of the most uh, interesting areas of science. I think I've always loved astronomy. And it's, it's a nice tie-in occasionally, of course, with, with skepticism, especially when we think back, uh, and our mutual friend Dr. Phil Plate was certainly involved heavily in this, in criticizing a lot of the silly myths about the moon landing or the moon landing hoax the moon landing never happened and and that sort of thing and you're a very popular presenter at many uh skeptical conventions yourself in fact the last time i saw you i think was um at the amazing meeting in las vegas it, it was and one one of the things that unfortunately a, a lot of people don't get to experience is someone talking to them about science who's talking from the perspective of love rather than talking from the perspective of must, must teach you all of these specific <laughs> concepts for your next exam. 
And I try to get to speak from the perspective of this is something that I'm passionate about. Let me share my passion with you. And because of that, I've gotten to go to the amazing meeting. I've even gotten to visit you down there in Australia yeah. for when the amazing meeting was down there. And um, it, it's opened the door for me to say not only here's the science that I love, but also here's how you can be part of doing the science I love. And we've launched recently me, Phil Plate, who you just mentioned, Fraser Kane, and many others, noisy astronomer, bald astronomer. Uh, we've launched a site called CosmoQuest, where we work to take this audience of people that we garner from these conventions and bring them online with us and invite them to help us look through data from a variety of different NASA missions and find the scientifically interesting features in the middle of vast plains of craters, of great long stretches of volcanic uh, tubes that stretch across the surfaces of a variety of rocky worlds within our solar system. That's so interesting, and I think relatively recently I seem to have remembered, it was, I think it was Dr. Phil Plate posted up a, um, a picture or some information about a double impact crater on the moon, which was so fascinating. Yes, and and that's that's the cool thing about so much of this is uh, we're still learning things, we're still discovering things, and that double crater that was one of those moments where a broken comet or a shattered asteroid in its orbit around our sun, well, its orbit happened to just intervene with the surface of the moon, and so you see this set of craters one next to another, created by a broken object getting even more broken up as it hits the moon. Isn't that interesting? And and it's just beyond our wildest imaginations. What even on the moon? What is waiting for us to there to be discovered? And what we're doing now is we're working to find those scientifically interesting places that someday we'll be able to go visit. Maybe not you and I. Maybe it'll be the next generation, or maybe it'll just be such a rare number of people that that. It's going to be 10 other people and neither of us are part of that 10. <laughs> but but we're finding those places today that in tomorrow's tomorrow, someone is going to go and stand and pick up a rock and explore it for us. Absolutely. And I, I guess if we can't go there, Pamela, at least we can see uh, very rich images and hopefully, you know, a very detailed, almost virtual reality of these places. I would find that exciting. I would find it exciting to walk across a virtual reality simulation of the moon, which was perfect to the nearest millimeter or something like that. And, and we're actually getting to the uh, ability to do things sort of like that with, with Mars. The Mars Curiosity Lander, it has a set of eyes separated, much like our own human eyes are separated one from the other. And using stereoscopic imagery that's been sent back to us from the Red Planet, we can ride along with the rover looking through its eyes and see that 3D reality that stretches around us. That virtual future is is coming, and there's actually a YouTube video that was put together during the Hackfest at the American Astronomical Society's meeting this year that will allow you with, with red-blue 3D glasses to, well, ride along and see that 3D visage of Mars. That's exciting. Who knows, Pamela, maybe we can invent a new name for this technology. Oh, I don't know. We could call it the holodeck. <laughs> You know, I'm all for that happening, and the sooner the better. And not only do I want that hollow deck that allows you to go in and immerse yourself in a virtual world, but what I'm waiting for is the hollow deck that allows me from my computer and you from yours to join one another in a virtual collaborative space where we can conjure up the virtual whiteboard and work simulated human to simulated human at building a real future. It just boggles the mind, doesn't it? And I think I was—I uh, sent you a little message the other day saying uh, how nice it would be, something that you and I have never done. You've never taken me out away from the lights and said, let me show you some of my stars. And I think that would be quite a wonderful experience. I, you know, Richard, some of the best stars to be seen are actually down in your part of the world. So this <laughs> one's on you to find a new way to bring me back down under so that well, maybe this time we can escape the confines of Sydney and go out and look up at the amazing southern skies. 
Oh, the, the, the man who does the voiceovers for The Skeptic Zone, a guy called Jim Wilshire who does the introductions, says, hello, welcome to The Skeptic Zone. He lives on a, um, a farm down in, uh, near Albury, which is way out in the countryside. And when I visit him from time to time and I walk outside at night, there is no light pollution. It's just extraordinary, just beautiful, beautiful seeing conditions. And and the amazing thing is that in those dark places, on those spring nights when the Milky Way is overhead and the large and small Magellanic clouds are off to the side, like someone has taken a bit from the Milky mm. Way, just tossed it away. Um, on those nights, we can really see the diversity of what our sky has to offer as we peer out into star-forming regions like the Great Korean Nebula, as as we see the disks of our the disk of our own galaxy in the messed up regions of those two by galactic clouds. The the sky down there just has so much to offer, and and let's let's never forget the dark expanses of dust that that make the emu constellation that got named because of the little critter that well walks around in the outback of your country <laughs> not so little um and one thing that i've i take advantage of in the last few years and it's very few years um recently are these interesting apps that you have on various handheld devices like ipad and like iphone etc which lets you hold your device up to the sky swing it around, and it will tell you what you're looking at in the sky. I, I think that's just marvelous. Yeah, the, the Star Walk app is one of the ones that I tend to use the most. It's one that uh, actively supported the International Year of Astronomy and kind of won me over when it did that. And the, the, the apps, they allow us to look up and not just go, wow, what is that, but to go, wow, what is that, and find the answer. Mm. And it's that ability to understand our universe that I think makes astronomy so magical. We actually have the ability through observation and the application of math to actually, with our own minds, working at our own desks, to figure out what that is that we're seeing in the sky, to understand what are the origins of our universe, and to predict how our universe is going to change as well, future generations and future civilizations continue to watch it through time. Now, of course, your love of all things astronomical is, is well known. And your love of podcasting, too. Tell me, how long, how long now has Astronomy Cast been going? Oh, wow. It's really quite amazing. We, uh, we're coming up on seven years now. Really? It's, we, we started this in September of... 2006 and and we're still going strong and it's it's really been amazing to get to work with fraser kane the producer over at universe today and to publisher of other of universe today and to to get to every week be able to take on new topics in astronomy and i don't see our show ever ending because Astronomy itself is is constantly changing. We're constantly learning new things. And over time, we're going to get to go back and change some of the shows that we've done and redo them as as our understanding gets redone as well. That's very exciting. It's it's one of the, the podcasts I started listening to a long time ago. Well, certainly, of course, before the Skeptic Zone podcast um, started, started up. And since I think... Either episode one or episode two, Pamela, of the Skeptic Zone, I've been plugging astronomy cast, so I hope I get a gold star for that. You, you certainly do, and you, you've been a friend of the show for a long time. I, I remember that first Dragon Con when, when we met, and uh, it's, it's great that we work in a field where we can continue to support one another through the years, and this is part of the reason that I've stayed with new media for so long and why I've continued to find new ways to evolve what I do to match the constantly changing technologies. It's because I get to work with people who actively say, how can I help? How can we support each other? How how can we make the world better through science, through skepticism, using new media to support one another and support society? It was the first time I was at uh, Dragon Con in Atlanta, Georgia. I think that was 2008. And uh, I was uh, 
lamb in the woods. I didn't know what was going on. It was completely incredible. There's all these people running around in costumes and the high heat and the, the bizarre goings on. But um, I think I was introduced to you by a fill plate. So that was a, a very nice memory. You, you know, earlier this evening, I actually found a picture from that year that has the three of us. And I'll have to send that to you. <laughs> That's fantastic. Now, Pamela, these sites that you mentioned uh, earlier, this um, the, the Google activities, what's the best place people can go to check out more about what you're doing? Well, CosmoQuest.org is uh, the central area where we go and hub together all of our various content. Uh, you can also find my personal writing at StarStrider.com. And uh, follow me on Twitter or Google+. Plus. Uh, I'm either Star Strider or go by my own name, Pamela Gay, across all the different media. Well, Pamela Gay, I can only wish you unpolluted skies and good seeing conditions. I am so glad to be part of your show, and I hope that together we can build a more skeptical future. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you. Astronomy Cast takes a facts based journey through the cosmos as it offers listeners weekly discussions on astronomical topics ranging from planets to cosmology. Hosted by Fraser Kane of Universe Today and myself, Dr. Pamela Gay of Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, this show brings the questions of an avid astronomy lover directly to an astronomer. Together, Fraser and I explore what is known and being discovered about the universe around us. Join us each week as we take a facts-based journey through the cosmos at astronomycast.com. Now it's time for Dr. Rachie Reports with Dr. Rachel Dunlop. Hello, listeners, and welcome to Dr. Rachie Reports. Well, this week I want to discuss false balance, which is defined by Wikipedia as a term used to describe a perceived or real media bias, where journalists present an issue as being more balanced between opposing viewpoints than the evidence actually supports. Now, if that sounds a bit jargonistic, give me a minute and I'll explain it to you. But I want to talk about false balance this week in the context of science and medicine reporting in the mainstream media. So false balance has long been a problem in the mainstream media, particularly when it comes to stories concerning science and medicine. And it's a curious occurrence since most journos will scoff when you propose they invite a flat earther on to a story about circumnavigating the globe or a Holocaust denier in stories about World War II. But the parallels to inviting an anti-vaxxer on to a story about vaccination for the sake of balance somehow escapes them. Of course, this means that anti-vaxxers exploit the idea of balance by claiming there are two sides to every story and disseminating the idea that there is a vaccine debate. Well, in the interest of saving time and going over old ground, there is no debate. The science is in, vaccines work, and the benefits far outweigh any associated risks. But before anyone bothered to challenge the media that false balance was bad MK. Okay, the anti-vaxxers got virtually a free ride in the Australian media. Now, the Australian Vaccination Network, used to be fronted by Meryl Dory, who has recently retired, was a media darling, and they were the go-to people for just about every story concerning vaccination in Australia. So juxtaposed alongside highly qualified experts in immunology, medicine, paediatrics, this lent legitimacy to Meryl Dory's opinions and elevated her to the heights of expert despite the fact that she has absolutely no qualifications apart from a brain, which she will happily tell you. Now, when Ms. Dory was described on the program for the Woodford Folk Festival several years ago as Australia's leading expert in vaccination, I didn't see her falling all over herself to correct this misconception. However, something has happened in Australia over the last few years that has been very encouraging, and slowly a shift away from false balance with respect to vaccination stories, has begun, and largely due, in my opinion, to a tireless campaign by a bunch of concerned citizens who loosely fall under the umbrella of Stop the Australian Vaccination Network, or SAVN. So why is this so important? 
Well, a recently published paper, which is quite a preliminary study, but in any case is interesting, highlights the reasons why false balance can actually be dangerous. So using the consistently reported but thoroughly unsinkable rubber duck of an autism vaccine link, the authors Dixon and Clark investigated how this reporting style influences judgments of vaccine risk. So they randomly assigned 320 undergraduate students to read a news item presenting either claims both for or against an autism vaccine link, a purely anti-vaccine, vaccines definitely cause autism article, and a there is no link article. Now, unsurprisingly, they reported that the participants who read the article saying vaccines cause autism indicated they would be less likely to have their children vaccinated in the future. And this observation is supported by other research showing that viewing an anti-vaccine website for 5 to 10 minutes increased perceptions of vaccination risk and decreased perceptions of the risks of not having vaccines. Also from this research, more importantly, viewing an anti-vaccine website significantly decreased intentions to vaccinate in parents, which persisted five months later. And this translated into parents having their children receive fewer vaccinations than recommended. And indeed, data also shows us that people that get their information about vaccines purely from the internet are less likely to vaccinate their children. However, what was more surprising and shocking about the findings of Dixon and Clark was that the balanced article produced a stronger effect than the link-only article. So let me just repeat that in case you missed it. The false balance article, citing a possible link between vaccines and autism, left participants feeling less confident about the safety of vaccines than the vaccines definitely cause autism article. Wow. So the authors suggested the reasons for this may be due to false balance eliciting a stronger perception that experts are indeed divided or that experts truly are uncertain whether vaccines cause autism. And of course, we know that they don't. So this study suggests that false balance reporting with respect to vaccine safety lowers people's intentions to vaccinate their children in the future, more so than simple straight up anti-vaccine reporting. So this issue of false balance was covered extremely well on a recent episode of Australia's Media Watchdog program, which is called Media Watch. Now, the segment under scrutiny features Meryl Dory commenting on a measles outbreak and coincidentally quotes her as saying, and quote, All vaccinations in the medical literature have been linked with the possibility of causing autism, not just the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. This makes me so mad. I'm told that this show is required viewing for all journos and getting a mention is a black mark against your name. Such is the power of Media Watch. The story is a smackdown of a report which featured on Win News and was later the subject of complaints to the communications regulator. In the story, the host, Jonathan Holmes, said, But Meryl Dory's deceptively named Australian Vaccination Network is in fact an obsessively anti-vaccination pressure group that's immunised itself against the effect of scientific evidence. Dory's claim about the medical literature linking vaccinations and autism is pure unadulterated baloney. Now, some people have suggested that this story functioned as a warning to anyone else in the media should they foolishly decide to go the false balance route. There are rumours, in fact, very strong rumours, that some media outlets in Australia have a complete ban on talking to Ms Dory. And it will be interesting to see if this still stands now that she is no longer the president and spokesperson. In my own experience, I've recently started telling media if they plan to do a balanced story, then they will not get my participation. Interestingly, when I was recently asked to go on the primetime show The Project to talk about the Academy of Sciences immunisation booklet, I asked if they planned to also have on an anti-vaxxer. The producer told me they had asked someone from the anti-vax side who had refused to participate unless they could be interviewed live. Now, as far as I'm aware, the project pre-records all their crosses to allow for editing, but the anti-vaxxer didn't want to be made to look silly in the editing process. And yes, the irony has not escaped me. (laughs) The producer told me it was ridiculous that they would expect special treatment when everyone else is pre-recorded and edited, so they opted to be not included in the show. Well, their loss, I guess... I mean, the project is prime time, national and watched by a huge number of people. So it's great exposure for your crackpot ideas. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. 
So after appearing on the project again last Wednesday, and if you want to see this video, you can look at my blog at the end of this segment, to talk about Melanie's marvellous measles, I was pleasantly surprised to see a thread on the project's Facebook page addressing precisely the issue of false balance. Now, a commentator left this comment which said, I'm normally a huge fan of this show, but I was totally disgusted at the interview reviewing the measles book. The project responded less than half an hour later, saying, We decided that speaking to someone who actually has medical training and understands disease was the way to go. The commenter then says, So why didn't you? and lists a bunch of doctors who they claim would have been more suitable than myself, including Dr. Archie Calicarinus, who passed away last year, so I'm not quite sure how he could have been on the show. Sometimes it pays to read what you copy from Whale 2 before you paste it into a public forum. The project then responded by saying, Anti-vaccination is a fringe opinion. For every five doctors who oppose vaccination, there are 95 who support it. We are not obliged to provide equal time and space to unscientific and dangerous viewpoints. And if you want to find that thread, there's a link on my blog. After all the work we've done in an effort to educate the media about the dangers of false balance in vaccination and medical stories, perhaps it is finally paying off. Of course, you will still find incidences of false balance in the Australian media, but I like to think that it is improving. And given the latest research, it's especially encouraging to see a primetime mainstream commercial television show take a responsible health stance. Congratulations to the project, and I'll certainly come back on any time you want, editing included. So you can find this blog post on the official blog of The Skeptic Zone at skepticsbook.com. And until next time, this has been Dr. Reggie Reports. In a world where the truth is a matter of opinion, where messages are received from beyond the grave, and reason is sidelined for magical thinking. Only three men stand between the truth and a postmodernist abyss. What date is it? Seven, eighth? Seventh, eighth? Uh, this is impressive. It's, it's, these artist impressions. They're not. They're photographs of Chinese lanterns. It's not. It's not. <laughs> We are not well researched. Yeah, because I... Good I, God, we're full We of don't it. discuss cryptozoology on this show very often, because we don't know anything about it. That's true, that um, is true. The price <laughs> gets lower and lower and lower, and then he hits a ceiling. <laughs> it's a ceiling from the room below. <laughs> skeptics with a K from the Merseyside Skeptic Society. Find us on iTunes. Or, you know, don't. Here's Maynard's spooky action. At a distance. Well, last time I spoke to this guy, it was a convention in Sydney and we were in the Masonic Hall. And it wasn't a Masonic convention, it was actually a skeptics convention in Sydney. But right now I'm in Embiggen Books, which I only recently found out is named after the Simpsons episode. I did not even know it was a made up word. So, who are you and why are you fooling with my mind? Uh, my name's Warren Bonnet, and I just am tempted to fool with your mind, I guess. Um, Embiggen was first actually coined in the 1800s, by the way. Get out! Mm. So uh, the Simpsons just ripped something off from again? I don't think they knew. Uh, it's a pretty oh. arcane reference. It only appeared the once, and it was in a, uh, like a gentleman's miscellany. And it oh. was referring to, I think, the growing trends of uh, hobbyists in, oh. in, uh, in the UK at the time. So, so it did originally mean to make larger? Yeah. Yeah, wow. that's right. Mm. Oh, that's so, cool. Yeah, but it only occurred the once, but since then the uh, the Simpsons did it, and we saw it in a string theory paper. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, of course, this is a, a bookshop for the thinker, which means I don't even know why you're still open. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good point, good point. <laughs> I mean, there's not, not a lot of people going, like, hey, I've got to get to some philosophy right now before I go watch the final of The Voice. That's right, mm. and uh, we're here just for them. Well, we're, we're near the Wheeler Centre, which is the Melbourne Centre for Writing, Literature and Ideas, mm. and uh, that was a pretty intentional move on our behalf to be near a hub for that already and and just focus a little bit more on the sciences because they focus on literature and humanities and we have a strong science bent obviously so we wanted to sort of 
add that kind of balance and, and it's been working reasonably well. Yeah, because I mean, look, times are tough with a bookshop like when you've got people like Coles or Kmart that can buy the book cheaper and post it to you for what you can listen and put it on the shelf. That's tough competition. Yeah, the the big ones are always a problem, but we mostly don't overlap in, in the subjects we carry. So most of the bookshops um, don't stock our best sellers. Okay. So, now, now, actually, what goes wild and crazy here? I mean, uh, what's the Harry Potter of your bookshop? Uh, well, uh, one we were talking about earlier, Demon Haunted World, Carl Sagan. Uh, the other one tops at the moment would be um, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, the book wow. you selected earlier. Um, in fact, I used that for, we had the uh, incredible Randy who was just, he was like kind of, no, he was the amazing. I would say he, he should use that in his act. Amazing. He's incredible and amazing. Really? And but he actually did a magic trick for like three or four people and used me as, as the foil. And we're buggered if we can know how he did it, which I think is what a magic trip's all about, isn't it, really? It is. He's very, very good. Yeah. I just had me pick a book off the shelf, and he knew the word in the sentence that I picked. And as far as I know, I picked that book freely. And at random. Yep. Yeah, so that can only confirm that he's a member of the uh, Illuminati. Without a doubt. Well, it's obvious, really, isn't yeah. it? Obvious. <laughs> Actually, you have got some great uh, uh, books about anomalies and conspiracies in here as well, which I will be checking out before I leave. Yes, we do. Uh, well, probably the best one on those is the uh, Aronovich book, Voodoo Histories, which I highly recommend to almost anyone to read. It's just, it, it demonstrates to you very clearly that conspiracy theories are not harmless. And what is the strangest moment you've had here? Because this would be a place where alternative thinkers would be drawn to, and of all kinds. And uh, have you had any moments here where you go, oh, look, can I just have a book that sells romance novels? I want a shop that just sells romance novels or something. Mm -hmm. Uh, We do. Um, Probably the weirdest, though, is a guy by the name of UFO Bob who came in uh, and... I like his name already. Yeah, wearing a silver hat, saying that he read all of the books on our shelves uh, as soon as he walked in the door. And do we have any cameras? Because uh, CIA keeps an eye on him uh, Mm -hmm. after the abduction. Right. Well, he must be having a hard time because just about everybody now carries a camera around with them and a device that could be hacked into so they could be recorded 24-7 if someone really wanted to. That may account for his jitters. You know, he was shaking a bit. And because what what uh, information did UFO Bob have that was uh, of international importance for the CIA to want? He didn't really say. I think it was probably more his special gift of uh, of uh, being able to see and understand and scan anything whatsoever in a split second and, and, and just get to the heart of it. So he's a security risk in that respect, I imagine. Well, that, that's pretty impressive. I mean, there are real things like trap wire to be concerned about um, that uh, maybe he should concentrate on that. <laughs> True, mate. I think he should get in contact with Julian Assange and get together and form a little I don't know, hacker group of some kind. I can see the press conference now, Julian Assange. Uh, look, uh, to uh, bolster my, my cause for uh, uh, yeah, a UFO Bob. We really believe in, in one key aspect of the shop, and that is that we need more cultural spaces on the street that are not necessarily dedicated towards sort of either hedonism or under, you know, or in just straight-out pleasure-seeking or um, silly stuff. So um, at the moment, most bookshops don't really even have much of a science section. There aren't many that people can find because they're actually harder to find now because they're having to find smaller and smaller spaces because of the increasing in rent. And that's actually the big problem in Australia for bookshops. It's not overseas or anything like that. Rents, huge problem. We over out, out rent anyone in this wow. in this little planet of ours. Mm. Um, and just as a point for uh, for skeptics listening, everyone you know, supports what, what they see to be their version of reason and, and science. But you're actually putting your money where your mouth and your livelihood is. It matters to us. We didn't want to be just having those dinner conversations and and going and a, and have a great dinner conversation with people. And then everyone agrees, and then nothing happens. We. You know, we've got a little girl, she's three years old, and we are intensely committed to to try and give her a sort of an immediate cultural environment which is a positive benefit to her. Mm. Um, so, yeah, we're yeah. not neither of us are scientists or research scientists or anything like that. We, we can't do that sort of work, but this is something we can do, and I think it's necessary. 
And now, when we talk to, to musicians, we ask them what their favourite song is and that kind of thing. But what's your favourite section of the bookshop? What's the one where, even when you're walking past on a busy day, you might have a little quick look and go, I'll just have a read of this bit? <laughs> uh, it would be the brain sciences. Um, All right. Um, because it's the easiest way for me to be able to have uh, a discussion with someone about science that isn't interested in science because everyone's got a brain. They're interested in themselves. So it's not a self-help section, but we have books on how the brain works, how we can not see things, how we use confirmation bias, how, how group dynamics work based upon our individual biology. And I find that that's just one of the best... It just gives me a sense of strength when I'm going into bat for the for this team of science and reason. You can go... Read this book by Robert Burton. It's called On Being Certain. It's, it's brilliant. Or read this one by um, Daniel Kahneman on Thinking Fast and Slow because it is really one of the best books of the past 10 years, I think. Now, now I had a discussion earlier, and I, I probably disappointed you, in that uh, you recommended Demon Haunted World to me, Carl Sagan, uh, after, after the Sydney conference. And uh, I, I read it. The ideas are solid. I can't argue with any of the arguments, of course. And the book's great but I found it a bit dry and I found the book very hard going now am I the only person that's ever said I've had a trouble with the writing of Carl Sagan as far as you know oh no no we, we do get um, people that don't like him at all we can't, oh. can't stand him in fact um, that say they have a I mean, that's usually a fairly strong indication that they don't have the science bent that they actually proclaim to have but um, you know there are many different books um, like there's a big hoo-ha in the sceptic community at the moment about how you communicate. Don't communicate with aggressiveness. Don't communicate with sarcasm. Don't communicate like this. Don't communicate... Uh, well, quite frankly, nonsense. There's a reason there's millions of writers and millions of readers. There are millions of ways to listen. And and so there are, um, are books that might not... Will, will definitely work for a lot of people. It won't work for others. And so it doesn't surprise me. There's a, a fantastic scientist in the States by the name of Beatrice Gollum. Um, very unusual voice. Um, but uh, she's astounding in getting to she, the she, heart of she's things. She's not a Berkeley Hummer, is it? Which is those women that don't quite finish sentences. No, no. And they got, not a Berkeley Hummer, no. No, no, much, much, much higher pitch and slightly uh, discordant. Um, but she, she's extraordinary. She is relentless at getting to the the actual data and saying what you are claiming from your data is not what your data results suggest or or the data itself the abstract says one thing results and the data say something else and her team just do that well that's all they do they go through those papers how many books have you got on the shelf here just to give the listener the idea of the size of the shop here uh, we're getting just edging to 10,000. Uh, and no, that's as many CDs that I have. <laughs> I, yep, I understand, yep. <laughs> and, uh, and of that, uh, about uh, 5,000 are science books. Wow. Mm. Now, what is the one book that is painfully absent on your shelf? What is the book that hasn't been written or the book you would like to have in your shop that's absent? You go, gee, I wish we had a book about X or one that dealt with a certain topic. Is there one that you wish was here that maybe hasn't even been written yet? Oh, well, there's two that immediately come to mind. Uh, one is an Australian version of the Geek Manifesto. Mm-hmm. I think that needs to be done. Uh, and secondly, I want a better book on vaccines for the general public. Oh. Um, I want it to be as... So one, consu- one that's less scientific, you mean? Uh, like, like, like one that's basically using more normal term- uh, well, yeah, terminology that's easier to understand. Is that what you mean? More cons- yeah, more consumer-friendly. You know, the, the, most of the ones uh, that we have that are of good value uh, also employ a few scare tactics, and I don't like those uh, in that... Um, th- they can be useful, but they're mostly useful for people who already agree with the subject matter. Um, the ones that re- we really need are the ones with the nice family planning type images on the front with the, the doctors and the nurses, and it looks all nice and happy and, and carefree, but with really unthreatening language in, in the middle of it because the people who are getting this information, like myself and, and my partner, Kirsty, who run the shop, you know, when we were vaccinating our daughter... Um, it hurts them and they cry their heads off and you, as a parent you sort of hate doing that to them so you, you know that there are parents 
out there who get a lot of anxiety over doing that and we want to deal with those. They, they need to be communicated to, I think, in a fairly softly, softly way. Now, uh, a year or two ago, I, I approached a publisher's agent and I pitched to them an idea to do a, a history, uh, an electronic book, CD-ROM or whatever that would be, history of the dance parties that went on at the Horden Pavilion in the late 80s to early 90s. Photographs, lot, make it a big coffee table book, make it a history of something that at the moment is only an oral history. There is, there's other stuff around, but it's scattered. And she just said that no one would buy that book and the market is very limited and, and perhaps I could turn it into a fiction book with a fable at the end that showed that all that drug taking and fun had, had, a, had a sort of a karmic recourse on the person involved. And she said, could you take the sex and drugs out of it? <laughs> and I thought, well, hang on, I, I know why people went there. Number one was not the music. Um, and, that, that, yeah, that made me think that, you know, uh, that level of sort of economic censorship to a certain extent. Do you think anyone would want a book of such a, a limited history? Uh, do you think there would be any market for that as, as someone who actually sells books? I mean, you know, is that the kind of history in Australia anyone, anyone even wants covered to that degree? I'd talk to Melbourne Books, um, David at Melbourne Books. They do books precisely like that mm. yeah that's who I'd talk to on that um, but they will be smaller publishers mm. publishers with their fingers in the community as opposed to the big ones who have stumps in the community mm. um, so yeah definitely um, Melbourne Books is the first one that comes to mind because they've done similar things mm. what do you like with um, authors that come in here doing book signings and their egos it's a little bit like rock stars sometimes is it can be, but it usually isn't. Most authors are intensely humble. And look, long may you reign here. Now, for people that want to visit you online and see what you've got available, where can we find you? We're at uh, 197 to 203 Little Lonsdale Street, and we're right next to the State Library. We're about halfway between uh, Swanston and Russell Street. And your website, where can we find you online where you have friendly service? I've, I've, I've dropped you a line there and you got right back to me. And on Twitter as well, you don't muck about. No. <laughs> sometimes, I do get behind sometimes, but... Um, uh, yeah, at www.inbigginbooks.com. And of course, it's day two here, and we're almost into the morning tea break. But I think it's a good chance to have a stop by the Embiggen bookstall and see what's really been moving. What has been the favourite book this time round? Flim Flam. Oh, of course. Well, I would have thought that Randy fans here would already have that. Yeah, well, there's still a few that don't, and there were actually some people who uh, do have his book but wanted to get it signed. So. And has there been a rush for any, any book you haven't got? Has anyone been looking for Return to the Stars, Eric Von Daniken, for example? No, no, they, they have, we have had a few questions asked about uh, some books for kids, but that's it. Mm. Mm. Now you've got the really, really big questions book here for kids, the one I've got about life, the universe and everything, and the one about religions. Has there been good feedback about that book? Uh, well, not from the people here, but we get a lot of feedback from that through the shop. It's, it's a very good book. Now, what about the controversial demon-haunted world that I found a little bit dry, which you recommended for me, but I've got to say I'm glad I read it. Uh, how's that been moving? That always does well. Always. And uh, has there been a surprise seller this time around? Uh, no big surprises. I guess we're moving a few more of the flying... Uh, spaghetti monster than, than we expected. Oh, so the fl flying spaghetti monster would have been the breakout favourite this time around? Possibly, and Bad Farmer. Oh, Bad Farmer, yes. Actually, I, I, I hope to see Ben Goldacre once, because uh, after reading the book, I want to see him perform that. He would be very good out here. I'd like to see him come out a lot more often than he does. Now, we have had a couple of people come up with to show us how uh, they're using Kindles, just to show us that, uh, hey, I've got this book on the Kindle, isn't it great? No. Ah, gee, you must go, yeah, that's really great, thanks. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Desiree Shell, host of Skeptically Speaking. Check out our website at skepticallyspeaking.com and listen to us live on CJSR 88.5 FM in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. I now return you to the Skeptic Zone. Richard, another fantastic show. You know, I like doing the Skeptic Zone when we have an audience. Hello, audience. Yeah. Hello. Hello. 
<laughs> there you go. And ex- extra special people doing intros and outros. It's yes. great to be here in, in, in Wacky Central. You've never really been in the Skeptic Zone uh, studio, have you? As I, such? I think the term you're looking for is allowed. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Anyway, we, we better get on now, start working on our secret project. All the people are here for that. Well, I've got a secret project mm-hmm. to announce mm-hmm. too. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Yes, now, yes. remember when uh, we did Tan Las Vegas and all the listeners were so good to put in to have me come over there? It was great. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Had a great time there. Well, uh, as well as doing the 110 interviews for the Skeptic Zone, <sighs> of that 110, when I was interviewing people, 50 of the people I asked, oh, if you'd like a song, what would it be? Most skeptics completely stumped because music is not something you can talk about much at a skeptic uh, mm. convention so i've got two episodes coming up of the music of tam las vegas 2012 Eight, 18 songs is in part one and probably about the same much in part two and one thing about skeptics eclectic taste in music mm. we've got stuff I with the beatles brian setzer kiss some blue oyster cult stevie ray vaughan opera and uh, a bit of music from sherlock uh, and if you know these people, Tom, they're going to be on the show. Carrie Poppy's going to be on the show. Aaron with the Fez is going to be on the show. Bob's going to be on the show. And uh, the lovely lady from Doubtful News, she's also on there as well. Wow, Sharon. Yes. That's, what, Maynard. So, so that, that's coming out next week at maynard.com.au. Maynard.com. Check, Maynard.com. check that out. And if you don't like the songs in the show, you can't blame me because it's other people asking for them. I tell you what, Stefan, you should have been oh. there at, at Tam to see Maynard. We didn't see Maynard. We saw this blur, blur in yeah. a gold jacket. What was that? Oh, that was Maynard rushing off to a for an interview it was just something incredible I wish I'd been there well, but... well of the 110 interviews 50 of them had the music in it and I've had to rack through four and a half hours of interviews <laughs> to find the two hours for the show but it's been well worth it and everyone said it's, it's like going there again Mm, it's like being there again. I actually think you're writing writing a new song now with us uh, because skeptic rhymes with eclectic. I think, Ooh. I think that could be a good song. It Ooh. could be, yeah. It could be. <laughs> yeah. We're working. On that. We're in a studio right now, so <laughs> look, we should get it. Happening. We, we should get it happening. No, I think we better stick to stick to the uh, game plan here. We got to get this thing out. We have a secret project. Let's done. get on with our Let's secret project, it. folks. Secret projects coming soon. And all I can say at the moment is, watch this space and look out for solar flares. What does that mean? You've been listening to The Skeptic Zone. Visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for comments, contacts and extra video reports.